So um, I have uh, quite a few questions left over from the previous lessons. Uh, so I'll we'll just post them now. Um, they're not in any specific order. Um, I'm also still a little bit tired, so we'll just see how far uh, we can get. Um, so the first question is about um, shape shifting, as a, uh, specifically as the bird. Um, I think I talked uh, already a little bit about uh, shape shifting, that um, our spirit can inhabit many different types of physical bodies. And usually every physical body has more or less um, uh, a rough model of what the energy body should be like. So humans are different from each other, but humans are more or less one group of beings and cats is another group of beings. And uh, in shape-shifting, uh, you learn how to alter your energy body or how to create um, alternate energy bodies. It's also possible for a person uh, to have already a very different energy body and still incarnate in, a, in a, a body which is physically human. So for instance you could be a cat energetically and then still take incarnation in a human physical body. And by working with shape-shifting you can alter your energy body um, to yeah, more suit your purposes or what you want to do. Um, in shape-shifting um, you can move the, uh, the nadis, the energy channels which are in your body and you can also uh, create uh, 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 chakras by splitting chakras up into several chakras or merging chakras into one chakra. Um, the merging of chakras often creates more harmony, more balance uh, because there is only one voice, there is only one will, there is no possibility for different opinions within that chakra. Um, and splitting chakras often gives more detailed information because you have all these different views, all these different ways of relating with things. Um, birds are very sensitive animals. The bird is often seen also as a, as a symbol for contact with uh, with higher worlds, more subtle vibrations. Um, so in the uh, shamanic tradition uh, you have the falcon and the eagle. Uh, the falcon is very well known because it's a bird which hunts other birds, so it is uh, much better at flying, at in a way being a bird than other birds are. And the falcon is a very important uh, a symbol for the ability to uh, converse with, uh, with spirits and to deal with, uh, with other spirits because spirits are seen as belonging to the air or traveling through the air. Um, and you have the eagle. The eagle is uh, often the biggest bird, also the bird which flies the highest and has the sharpest eyesight. Um, so the eagle is often um, related to uh, the ability uh, to have a higher viewpoint, a more moral viewpoint, uh, more contact not so much with spirit, but really with the divine, or with the, the great spirit, um, or a greater ancestral spirit, spiritual masters, um, also uh, the ability to, uh, to prophesize, to to bring messages from the gods is also associated with the, with the eagle. Um, there are also some very other interesting exceptions. Uh, for instance, the penguin. The penguin is a bird which flies underwater, and it is therefore uh, a very useful bird when you want to uh, work with conscious dreaming, or uh, dream interpretation, or uh, meditation. Uh, because the, the water is the element of the, of the emotional, of the, in a way the personal and it is, the penguin really combines the ability to, to work with spirits also with the ability to work with yourself um, so penguins are often very good helpers in processes of personal transformation 
Um, so very big changes between the bird form and the human form are um, the amount and quality of the, both the head chakras and the hand chakras, or the wing chakras in birds. Um, so a human has uh, seven chakras in the hand, on the fingertips, the center of the palm at the base of the hand and has one chakra at the elbow. So in all <coughs> we have eight chakras in our, uh, in our arm and uh, we use our hands to of course manipulate objects and to touch things. Um, for birds, uh, birds travel much faster than land animals and they need to process information also a lot faster because of it. And also many birds, they have to be able to scan um, what is on the ground to find prey, to find food. Um, so the range of the chakras has to be a lot bigger because they fly high over the ground rather than touching things as we would do with a piece of fruit. Um, so in way transforming your, your arms to become wings, um, multiplies the amount of chakras which you have there because I've been observing different types of birds and I've counted between 16 and 23 chakras per wing so that's easily two to three times as much as uh, we humans have and also the quality of these chakras is quite high they're very uh, very focused very precise very pure so they give a quality for very precise readings but of course you get a lot of extra information if you start working with all these extra chakras so it can be confusing in the beginning and um, I would advise people not to try to work with all 27 uh, in each one at the same time when you're starting to work with bird medicine because then you've got suddenly yeah, up to 46 chakras where you first had yeah, uh, 16 and yeah, then you can get a bit of an information overload and start blocking yourself in your own transformation. So just focus on just a few chakras, see what they can tell you, see what other chakras can tell you, because all these chakras of the birds are also attuned very specifically to finding different energies. Certain ones are finding, uh, are helping you to, to read the energies of the earth, other ones are helping you to read the energies of plants or of animals or even of the other spirits which exist in the, in the air and allow you to navigate by feeling the currents of energy which are moving around you. Uh, so the bird medicine is, is very very useful if you want to uh, improve your, your sensitivity. Um, the other difference are uh, the qualities of the head chakras. In the same way as we humans uh, also use our head chakras to converse with you know, higher spirits, to receive guidance, uh, the head chakras in birds are also very strong, very dominant actually. So birds can easily be uh, inspired or controlled by spirits and by the energies around them. So this is also the reason why in uh, ancient times people used birds for divination. Uh, they would look at the behavior of the birds, the flights of birds, uh, and from that they could read the will of the gods, the will of the spirits, or actually the, the energetic weather, the energetic conditions, like for instance how a battle would go, could be predicted by looking at um, yeah, the flights of the birds. Will there be much death? Will there be less death? because the birds themselves react to the spirits which are around them. And by working with bird medicine, you can also um, develop your own head chakras to become more in tune and more receptive uh, uh, to these powers. So it's very good for inspiration and receiving messages from the, from the spirit world by uh, transforming your head chakras to be more bird-like. So the main difference is in the crown chakra uh, because we have only one crown chakra and it is not like dolphins who have four but birds will have two sometimes three but also I've 
also seen some birds which had eight crown chakras actually and that was um, yeah yeah a walking bird it was and often you see that with the walking birds the uh, crown chakras develop even more probably because they don't have the wing chakras as developed to pick up all kinds of energies or to connect with their surroundings and they compensate by having stronger developed head chakras um, and this uh, it's also a little bit schizophrenic to work with these multiple um, crown chakras because one of them is attuned to nature spirits other to your own spirit guys others to um, higher spirits or cosmic spirits or deities and you're actually noticing or feeling all these influences at the same time and also this is a process which can be rather confusing um, so bird medicine is a very powerful medicine but it's also quite difficult or taxing medicine and yeah people can go a little bit crazy if they overdo it in working with the, with the bird medicine um, there are also some very interesting um, legendary creatures um, which also have wings so the the, the coatl, the feathered snake is a, is a very famous one uh, of course you have dragons um, the, uh, the manticore the griffin um, and often the uh, the winged beings are all in tune more or less with uh, with greater powers with greater spirits and these are also very interesting forms to explore um, the coatl is very good at attuning to uh, various egregores um, it's often an intermediary between egregores and humans um, but more of course in the, in the uh, middle and south american culture but it can be worked with uh, quite well and they're quite nice and they're also very proficient healers um, so dragons are more caretakers of the of the land or of regions there are greater nature spirits but also yeah nature in itself is also yeah uh, working together with higher powers to create the right atmosphere for certain processes in, uh, in different areas in the world um, the griffin is a very nice protective creature. The, for those who don't know, the griffin is a cross between an eagle and a lion. So often it is shown as having a, an eagle's head and eagle's claws and wings and the hind body of a lion. Um, the griffin is uh, uh, very useful in uh, protecting energies, protecting secrets, um, also as a personal guard. Um, they are often uh, summoned by also white magicians uh, to guard certain yeah certain parts of knowledge so often if you encounter a griffin uh, this is often a sign that some yeah deeper knowledge holy knowledge uh, might be hidden nearby so it's also very nice to uh, to work with it um, and also to um, it creates a lot of focus, a lot of awareness, the, the griffin, but it's not very wide, so it is really very localized awareness which you get when working with griffins. Um, yeah, the manticore, I have to be honest, I have not worked with it. Uh, manticore is a creature, it's a lion with yeah, um, sometimes wings, sometimes no head of a human and uh, a tail of a scorpion or spiked tail um, I've not worked with it um, maybe that would be interesting to uh, see what the experiences can be with that one. so any more questions about um, uh, shape shifting uh, maybe just something more in general so it is um, often good to realize that your spirit is just using your current form um, and that your current form has a kind of a uh, it's 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 also uh, it's like a pattern which you get used to so the first shape shiftings are often a lot more difficult but yeah practice makes perfect and as your energy body gets more flexible the shape shifting will also become more easy um, one of the things you can uh, uh, you can do is just um, to get a hang of it 
just start splitting and fusing chakras. And if you get better at that, you can try to use mold or ask um, uh, a bird spirit to come to you and guide you in, in a way a process of reincarnating. So you go up with all your energy and all your consciousness and together with the bird spirit you go down into your body again but then as you go down you allow it to flow in a different way, to move in a different way. So in a way you're reincarnating with a different energy body rather than transmuting it while, you're, while you stay in it. So. Any questions about shape-shifting? By the way, I'm also starting to write a little fantasy story about shape-shifting, so it's a nice coincidence, or maybe not. So, <clears throat> the next question is about what can you tell about the purgatory in the sense of Christianity and shamanism? Well, <clears throat> in depends a little bit on the shamanic culture um, because uh, in a lot of shamanic cultures they simply believe that you are part of a people, so humans, dogs, cats, bears, cows, and um, um, your spirit comes from that people and goes back to that people. So if you die uh, after having lived as a human, you become a human spirit and you incarnate as a human again. And the same for a dog or a cow. So they basically stay within their own group. Um, it is possible to cross species. And these often uh, are very interesting shamans because they've had a lot of experience with, for instance, being a horse. And then they're actually a horse in a human form. And it can work very well with horses because they still have that knowledge and experience as part of their yeah, uh, memory from their previous incarnations. Um, but in that sense there is no real uh, purgatory. Um, they do realize that there is a, a space in between, but they see actually the process of being incarnated or working as a spirit guide as the process of transformation, as the process of learning. <clears throat> if you go to African shamanism, it becomes a little bit different. Um, in African shamanism, um, you can, in a way, uh, make deals. So a certain spirit will help you while you are incarnated, but <clears throat> as a price for the favors which the spirit uh, performed for you, you have to serve it after you die. And these are usually very set contracts, so every service or um, just to have them available like a subscription um, will result in uh, yeah, in a certain amount of years or lifetimes or services you need to perform. Um, so it is not related to the concept of sin, but it is related to a concept of harmony or balance uh, that you... yeah always there's a price to be paid for every power, all the knowledge. Um, so that can be kind of a purgatory. If you have used or abused a lot of power, then you have to pay for it um, after you're, uh, you're de-incarnated. Um, often, if you, if you look at, um, at incarnation, um, in, in the true shamanic cultures there is not really a preference towards being a human or a dog or a cat. Um, but basically with the, the idea of human supremacy there came also the inequality of the species. So most humans consider like an ant or a goldfish to be less than, uh, than themselves. And um, these ideas also entered into shamanism and um, also in, uh, in Hinduism, where they believe that if you have lived your life poorly, um, you will be punished by having a more limited incarnation. And uh, this is to a large degree true, because uh, karma karmatically we're also judged. Um, and depending on uh, yeah, your level, 
uh, you get lessons which are appropriate for you. And if being a human is too difficult, well then maybe you should be a frog and your life will be more difficult, uh, more, uh, more easy. Uh, so if you cannot deal with the, with the complexity of human life, you choose a form which is more suited to you. But this is not seen by karma actually as a punishment for bad deeds or evil deeds, just giving people the form which is appropriate to their level. Um, so there is a possibility for, um, for growth, but it is slightly different than people expect. Um, because if you look at it from a harmonical perspective, so look, how happy is the being, how one is the being with the divine, with the god, with the higher cosmos, uh, then animals are generally on a higher level than humans. Uh, because humans, well, are very open to um, influences from the Luciferical cosmos, very open to influences from Arimanic cosmos, much more than animals are, which are in the nature cosmos. Um, so even though we have a lot of potential, um, the amount of baggage we have as human beings usually makes us less spiritual than animals and less able to interact and to work together with these worlds than animals are. Um, so, yeah, there's something to be said for, um, yeah, uh, taking incarnation in a more natural form. Um, the concept of, of purgatory in, um, in Christianity is also based on a kind of intermediate forgiveness. So what's very important to understand is also that hell is not uh, a concept which was a part of original Christianity. Um, there was no, um, yeah, like eternal punishment, eternal damnation, uh, lakes of fire and brimstone where you would burn eternally. Um, there was a belief in reincarnation, just like in animist or in uh, shamanic cultures. Uh, however, the Greeks did have this concept of eternal punishment, eternal damnation. And I'm not sure where the idea of, of hell within Christianity came from, but uh, it's very likely that it is actually a Greek influence which found its way into Christianity, and that the hell is in a way just yeah, the, an updated version of, uh, uh, of the Tartarus. Uh, the part of the Greek underworld in which people are punished. And also the Greeks did not believe in reincarnation, so also this lack of reincarnation can also be due to Greek influence, which was very strong on, uh, in that era. The uh, purgatory was in a way um, yeah, seen as uh, an intermediate stage. So you have people who... Uh, commit deadly sins, they are spiritually dead and therefore they are not alive and yeah, they have to go to hell. Um, the other people are the people who are pure, who are perfect, who are in harmony with the divine and they can go to heaven, they can reintegrate. But many people are in between, so they are open for spiritual influences. Um, they can theoretically be saved, they can be reached by higher worlds, um, but the quality of their openness or their obedience to the signals they get is imperfect. And um, what to do with these people? So either if you have a dichotomous system, it is un, un, they're unfit for heaven because they're not good enough, but to yeah, condemn them like the, the worst type of criminals yeah, would also be unjust because they're in a way innocent, they're ignorant, they're not choosing, they're trying, but just too weak. And since the yeah, idea of reincarnation and learning through a process of different lives was removed from uh, Christianity, um, I think they came up with uh, the idea of purgatory as a place where yeah, you can transform and uh, this place also in the astral world does exist um, and many spirits use it but usually as uh, preparation for the next incarnation. So if I lead a life which is um, rather imperfect 
there will be a lot of um, parts of my energy body which are angry, which are frustrated because they had hoped to grow, to develop, to serve other people, to connect to the divine and they were not given this opportunity, they did not have this chance during my incarnation and these parts um, are poorly managed which results in a, in a, yeah, in a bad karma so I would have to take a more primitive incarnation and also these parts usually carry a lot of anger or disappointment or sadness which will pull similar events uh, towards the spirit which incarnates again. So by having an imperfect life if you would just immediately reincarnate your next life would suffer from all the imperfections from all the things you did wrong in your life. And as a kind of a mechanism of uh, divine grace um, you're given the choice to right the, your wrongs either in your next incarnation or in between incarnations. So there is a, a place in the astral world where your spirit is taken to after it has yeah, uh, let go of the world, it has released of it, uh, it has been released of its um, attachment. And in this place there are many spirits which who are teachers, who are specialists in uh, yeah, in a way mediation you could say, making you um, yeah, be at peace again with all these other parts which you've frustrated or which you've hurt so that you can come to a new agreement and a new uh, plan for, uh, for a next incarnation. Um, and often this next incarnation is of course um, a penance, so you have to compensate for the wrongs of your previous incarnation. Uh, so the next incarnation is indeed like kind of a little bit dictated by your um, by the decisions you make in this purgatory. Like if I would not use my healing powers I would have to compensate in the next life by healing a lot of people. Uh, but it is not so much a place of punishment except for having to face your own fear, your own anger, um, your own lack of love or care. Um, so you are confronted with your own mistakes and this can be uh, considered a form of torture, but I prefer to consider it more of a, of a lesson. And I know that to many people this is also a little bit um, yeah, sad, um, because many people believe in divine justice, like okay somebody hurt me and they may be too powerful or dead already or something and they believe that there are vengeful spirits who will teach them a lesson once they die. Um, but I have to say, fortunately for us, the universe is not that vengeful. It's not that interested in revenge for everything we do wrong. Especially because morality is very subjective. Right and wrong is usually quite subjective. Um, you are judged um, in how much you go against your path, in how much you um, fail to listen, fail to learn. So it is much more about the, the quality of your chosen life, how well you fulfill your chosen role, than if your role is light or heavy. Uh, you can learn a lot from being an enemy of God. Um, and you can also learn a lot from being a friend of God. And ultimately the process of learning, the process of transformation, to make you come closer to the divine, is what it is all about. And you can use different methods. And well, as we've discussed before, these methods which involve the dark cosmos or dark magic, um, they can work, but they're quite dangerous. Um, so in that sense, there is not so much a moral punishment, but there are consequences to all your actions. And part of them can be resolved through, uh, through purgatory. So the next question is also related to it. Um, can a regular person avoid going through the purgatory? Um, yes, it is a choice. It is possible to, um, when you die, you can uh, try to take possession of another body. 
So rather than completely incarnating, you become a possessing entity. Uh, this is not an easy thing to do, to drive another spirit from their body, but it can be done. Um, so this is one way to avoid purgatory. Um, another thing you can try to do is, of course, incarnate before you get to that stage. Um, and this is often a choice. Purgatory is, is, is not always uh, mandatory, but for most people it is effectively mandatory. Um, because they have no knowledge of how to move on to a next incarnation, how to navigate between the worlds. So they automatically end up in purgatory. There they're helped by the spirits and when they're ready, these spirits guide them towards their next incarnation. So unless you are able to guide yourself to your next incarnation, you have to go through this purgatory stage. Um, but it is not mandatory if you have enough knowledge, enough skill to reincarnate yourself again, then purgatory itself can be skipped. Um, so it is more, you could say, like um, a helpful stage rather than an obligatory stage. And also how long a person spends in purgatory, it's also very much of an individual choice. Just like how much karma, how much purpose you will take with you in your life. So it is possible to, um, to take a life and an incarnation in which you will just enjoy yourself, um, have a few powers, do some nice things and just have an easy life. Uh, it is also possible to have a life where you will have many drama and challenges and a lot of opportunities and a lot of risks. But yeah, it's, this is very much a choice. What you do see is that uh, people f tend to fall into a pattern. Like if you take, if you are uh, in, in personality, uh, for instance, uh, very prideful or you have a lot of confidence in your own abilities or you overestimate yourself or underestimate the problems, when you do that in this life, it's very possible you did that in previous incarnations as well. And that, then it will determine your line of incarnations until this trait itself is transformed. So you often see a lot of constancy. And some people have the tendency not to spend a lot of time in purgatory. And therefore their lives are very strongly influenced by their past incarnations. Other people who prefer to spend more time in purgatory they will have only positive effects of their previous incarnations rather than a lot of burdens from their previous incarnations. Um, purgatory is also a place where you can try to work on forgiveness, not only towards yourself, but also towards other spirits, other people who've also died and passed over. Um, you can grant them forgiveness or ask forgiveness of them, so you don't have this karma which needs to be carried out. So I do advise it. So is avoiding purgatory in harmony with the goals of spiritual growth? Um, well, I don't think so. It can be. Um, at times, a person may be in a lot of hurry. There are different periods in history in which certain events take place or are allowed to take place, pivotal moments. And when a person is unable uh, or really wants to work on such a pivot point um, and they de-incarnate, then sometimes they need to reincarnate very quickly to make use of that time period. And in these cases, like to wait longer, and to incarnate many years later, they might miss their opportunity. Um, and these are also um, cases in which possession often takes place because the spirit knows that to raise a new body and to grow up and develop its powers, then they will miss their opportunity. So often these spirits will either seek to become a guide of a channel who's willing to, uh, to serve them and to help to carry out their mission. Um, either in combination or to the exclusion of their own mission um, or yeah the person will incarnate as quickly as possible and often also choosing a more limited incarnation so they might choose as a 
animal which matures more quickly than a human just to be able to have an incarnated form and thereby use their authority of the incarnated form to influence the physical world. So humans often think that we are the ones who are guiding the, the spiritual growth of this planet and this is largely true but only partially. It is uh, very much about the collective energy and the collective energy can be inspired by higher beings but these higher beings can incarnate in human form as as leaders or masters but they can also incarnate in plant form or mineral form or animal form and also be spiritual masters so not all spiritual masters are human they can be stones they can be trees they can be animals and this is something very important to realize and also angelic beings and deities can also not only incarnate in human form but also in animal forms, in mineral forms. And um, so, yeah, those, there, there can be reasons for spiritual growth or spiritual development to avoid purgatory. But in general, I would not advise it. Can it happen that an more severe purgatory ensures better spiritual growth. Um, well, when it comes to that, it, it actually goes more into the domain of the agricore. Um, because the purgatory is a very, um, very basic system. Basically, it uh, it's, is created and the spirits who work there are there to harmonize the spirit so that the person upon incarnating won't fall apart, won't go insane or become schizophrenic or something else because of the infighting within its own being. So the uh, it's it's very much the, the normal purgatory is very much the domain of uh, of harmonizing spirits of in a way nature like spirits. Uh, the more advanced lessons you can also get after your life, they're actually given by egregores or deities or uh, similar beings. Um, so if you make no connection with these beings during your life, it is very unlikely you will encounter them in between incarnations. But if during your life you've worked with deities or angels or egregores, then after your incarnation you can reintegrate into that egregore or go to the realm of the deity to receive further instruction, further lessons on how to improve on yourself. And often also these egregores and deities especially will reward you with certain powers, lessons and insights as a result of your cooperation with them while you were incarnated. So it is not so much a purgatory but rather a reward system you could say, uh, which you are entitled to if you really devote yourself to, uh, to a deity or to uh, cooperation with an egregore. Um, so I wouldn't call the purgatory more severe, but the lessons and the insights which you can gain are a lot deeper. Um, so is it possible that the principle of purgatory works too here on earth, while the soul is incarnated? Um, yes and no, I would say. Um, we are, of course, surrounded by powers which will have their own agenda. Some of them are very friendly to us, others are less beneficial for our spiritual advancement. Um, but in the same way as in, in purgatory, we are confronted with our inner states. Um, also, depending on the quality of our aura, we will, um, yeah, uh, inner states will be reflected by the events which happen around us, by the things which people say to us. Um, so, uh, what they believe in India is that uh, to uh, be happy, to live a harmonious life, you need inner happiness, inner harmony. Uh, this is very true, um, because if you lead a very dramatic life with lots of struggles and fighting and pain and sacrifices, uh, this is also often an indication that 
there are very dramatic processes in your inner world, in your inner spirit going on, um, which may be results of your previous incarnations or um, just um, disharmony within your spirit. Um, it can also be a result of a choice. Um, because you can choose to be harmonious in a way that the hierophantic path to be in touch with all forces to accept all forces but if you take sides uh, for instance you become part of one egregore well you will automatically have the other egregores or certain other egregores as enemies also if you choose to serve or to work with a specific cosmos uh, then because of your commitment to that cosmos the other cosmoses will compete with you same if you choose to work with light beings or dark beings, then the other side will form a competition with you. So it is possible to have a very uh, harmonious life, but this is also a very complex thing. Uh, you would yeah, have to approach the level of a spiritual master, and even then most spiritual masters have very tough and very dramatic lives still. Um, so even though like theoretically it is possible, um, usually I would think that uh, having a dramatic life is um, a positive sign of commitment, of connection with forces, while having a very uneventful life is more of a signal of being detached from forces, not being involved in the, in the spiritual process, but rather being dragged along by all the powers which surround you. And of course if you go along with everything, if you fall for every trick, then um, yeah there is no opposition you are just floating along but at the moment you stand for something you have principles uh, there will always be friction and it is from this friction that we gain strength that we gain knowledge that we gain insight both about ourselves but also about the other things which we have friction with and this is why it is very important to not just fight your enemy but also to love your enemy because through love you can connect with them, you can understand them, you can learn from them. And ultimately, of course, you and they are one because we are just in a... We are currently in a very polarized universe, in a very polarized world, but ultimately higher up the polarization will disappear. Can prayers help a newly dead person ease the burden of the purgatory sufferings she or he is supposed to receive? Is it okay to do so or better not to intervene? Definitely. Um, prayers are um, appeals to higher powers. And you can appeal on two principles. You can appeal to divine justice and you can appeal to divine mercy. And um, appealing to divine justice, um, if a person has indeed yeah, done good things, done nice things, then you can request that indeed the, the, the higher worlds, the higher beings recognize that, recognize their service and reward the person um, for yeah, all the things they've, uh, they've done in their, in their incarnation. And this can uh, lead to a lot of assistance in uh, creating a better incarnation uh, for the future. Um, it is, in a way, um, you can say it, it's, it's like a karmic bank account, but only other people can, uh, yeah, can access it sometimes. Because it is very difficult if you are an altruistic person, not thinking of your own interest, to say, I want more power, I want more knowledge, I want more this, I want more that. And because of your altruism, you might not get the rewards you should be getting, unless other people yeah, intervene, pray for you, and um, help you also to take care of yourself. And I think this is also a very good balance. If that person took care of you during yeah, your life, uh, when they're dead, you are in a very good position to help them uh, uh, move forward. And also one of the very nice things you can do with a prayer is also uh, through your attention donate a little bit of your life force because life force is an enormously powerful transformative energy and 
with a little bit of life force uh, and a lot of transformations can be made which would otherwise take much much longer and much more effort so by giving yeah a little bit of life force or making a little sacrifice like sacrificing some fruit for instance or a meal for the deceased person with this energy they can transform and harmonize their spirit transform their spirit so it's much easier to reach their next incarnation and they can reach their next incarnation in a better state Um, oh yeah, that was uh, appealing to divine justice. It can also appeal to divine mercy. Um, the, ultimately, the goal of of, uh, of incarnation is our our transformation. And um, while the universe is a, is a place of balance, it's a place of harmony. So if we unbalance things, we have to set things right. And uh, if we unbalance things a lot, then setting things right may take really a lot of time because it's easier to break something than to build something in general. So it can be that if you have one poor incarnation, you have to incarnate three times just to compensate for it. Uh, fortunately, there is divine justice, uh, divine uh, mercy, sorry. And the principle of divine mercy is basically that ultimately your mistakes are there for you to learn from and once you have learned from it once you have transformed yourself once there is no longer the risk of you making the same mistake it may be that you upset a lot of things but setting them right is not bringing you any new knowledge you don't learn anything new from it it is just paying a lot of debt but there is no spiritual growth to be gained from it and in these cases when the person has had the realization you can apply for divine mercy so that uh, a large part of yeah the compensation they would have had to make karmically uh, will be removed from the slate uh, often it is uh, required for the uh, for the person to at least make a token uh, reparation uh, to have uh, to acknowledge their their flaw, to show humility, to show surrender uh, to the higher powers in order to receive this mercy. So, if the person is indeed a person who's able to do that, uh, who can surrender to higher powers and can be humble and uh, can learn from their mistakes, uh, then an appeal to divine mercy can be uh, very useful. Uh, in general, I would advise people praying to uh, uh, the, the feminine side of God, so Mother Mary, Mother Earth, um, Kali, uh, because these uh, feminine powers, they often have a very strong um, liberating, uh, healing uh, quality, uh, of also bringing peace. Well, often the more masculine side, which is much more rigid, is more in involved with the with the justice side. Um, it's often more hard, more un unwielding, unbending. Um, so this is not true for all cultures, because yeah, we have of course uh, Lady Justice, but in general, I feel that uh, this is helpful in uh, in prayers or making contact with also spirits or egregores to, uh, to help people. So, the last question on this subject and then I think I'll also hold the questions for today um, is in general what are we supposed to do with our prayers for the soul, for the newly dead? Well, um, there are several powers we can appeal to. Um, there are of course the, uh, the death angels, the spirits who guide and the person after death, who try to protect them also, so their powers are not taken. Uh, so the first thing to do after death is to pray in a way for protection of the person who recently died. Um, then they go into a process of, in a way, yeah, purgatory and judgment. 
and it often then it is good to appeal to uh, yeah the, the local cosmic powers the powers of the sun of the earth of the planets um, of the local polytheistic deities uh, so that they are recognized for have, having worked with these powers in their lives and also that they will be given a, an appropriate new opportunity in their next incarnation or in between incarnations because even if you are a spirit you still will need an energy body you still will need to work with powers and have connections with things um, then I would also appeal to the, um, the yeah gods of karma and, and justice uh, and also to the powers of, uh, of mercy um, yeah also to uh, free yourself as good as possible from uh, uh, from your previous incarnation um, the other thing to do is also to see <coughs> If you might be able to accept some of the burdens or do some of the things which the person was unable to do. Um, so often for a spirit they still have needs or hankerings like if only I could have said something or done something. Um, and you can invite the spirit to come to you while you are doing that. So for instance if the spirit always wanted to go mountain climbing for instance well when you go mountain climbing invite the spirit to be with you to be your guide and then yeah without having to it doesn't have to take a new incarnation to fulfill those unfulfilled desires which it had in its incarnation so often it is nice to try to consult the person who died to ask them is there anything more which you wanted to do in your life and shall we do that together uh, this is usually after the period of adjustment, so usually about six weeks after their death. So they have had some time to adjust to their new state, otherwise they're just in a, usually in panic or in chaos and they might possess you. So wait a bit for that. So, um, I think then uh, I will just pause and... Um, with the answering of the questions and see if there's any new questions or remarks coming up. I don't see nothing coming up. So I think it might be nice maybe to do a little uh, sample prayer then to, uh, yeah, so that people can have a little example of um, how these things could work. Um, a good friend of mine died quite recently, about four months ago, and I've spent some time, well, helping him along, but a bit of extra prayer can never hurt. So um, he himself was um, uh, yeah, a good person, a moral person, but also not a spiritual person. He was a materialist. Um, so therefore he lacked some, well, connections. Um, and this has been my main effort in trying to help him, uh, in trying to still make that connection to an egregore um, after his uh, de the incarnation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Spirits of Wisdom, Guides on the Path of Light, I pray to you, In the name of both our Masters, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the glorious victor over all our sins and obstacles, and our guide through the dark places through which we must walk. I 
I ask of you to serve our master and act like him for my brother Harold. For he has always strived to serve others, to serve the light. But he has fallen into darkness, the darkness of ignorance. I ask of you that you may guide him and counsel him and inspire him to seek out the egregores of light, to seek out the higher cosmos, so he may continue serving all that is right and good. with your blessings and your guidance. It would not be fair for me to ask for your help without offering my help for my brother as well. If there is something I need to do or I can do for my brother, please enlighten me and guide me so I may carry his burdens the same way he carried the burdens of many others during his incarnation. My thanks, spirits of wisdom, guides to the path of light and light egregores of the higher cosmoses for hearing my plea. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, if there are no more questions, then I suggest we uh, call it a day for today and then I think the next session is about somewhere 6th or the 8th of uh, August I think, something like this, but I will keep you posted and I will also send you the leftover questions, there are still about 5 leftover questions. Um, so thank you all very much again for listening and the beautiful inspiring questions you emailed me. Um, and I'll uh, put this lesson and some other stuff. Um, I have two more lessons which I taped. I will also put them on YouTube. So you can look forward to those. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Goodbye. You.